Thank you, and, and thank you, Nancy, and, and all of you for uh, inviting me to come up here. So, um, you know, I, uh, I, I started, as we discussed in the, in the coffee group a little while ago, I started working on autism just a few years ago, and I am by no means an expert on this topic. Um, I've also been here all day chatting with people. So if I start saying things that just make no sense or mumbling incoherently, I'm depending on you to interrupt me and ask questions. Or even if I am making sense and you want to interrupt me and ask questions, that's good too, okay? Um, so, um, uh, and, and help me out, okay? So if they're, they're gonna be, I'm sure there are gonna be th things that are gonna come up, come up in the questions. Again, I'm not a pro at this stuff, so uh, between us we should be able to make some headway. Um, so, um, I, so to this crowd, I mean, you know this, right? So aut autism is defined based on a particular set of diagnostic criteria. Um, but there are a whole bunch of other things going on as well. Um, and I, I was particularly drawn to this, that there's hypersensitivity to sensory stimuli, given that I've mostly worked on sensory systems, mostly worked on the visual system. Uh, that struck me as being important. Um, uh, and, and when I learned about this, um, uh, that also struck me as being really important. That, uh, and it's kind of controversial. It hasn't really been sorted out completely. Uh, but there are a surprisingly large number of individuals with autism who also have epilepsy and an even larger number of individuals that apparently have kind of subclinical epilepsy. Uh, if you look at their EEG, it looks like the kind of EEG you would expect to see in a person who did have epilepsy, but these are people who have never had seizures, uh, but they're diagnosed with epilepsy. So here's an example that I got from a, uh, from a neurologist uh, in New York. This is EEG from a kid, a uh, child with autism. And you know, I don't know how to read these things. I'm not a neurologist. I don't look at this kind of stuff, these kind of clinical EEG scans. Uh, and so you, know, so, you look at, so you look at this thing, um, and these little spiky things here um, is exactly the kind of thing that you would expect to see um, in an individual that, with epilepsy in between seizures. So this, this, this individual um, uh, patient has no history of seizures. Um, uh, and, uh, and that actually seems like uh, that, that if you find anything you know, in which the, the numbers might be as big as this, um, that, that seems important. Now, it's not clear that the number is that big. Um, and, the, and the studies that have been done on this and published on this um, you know, uh, are mostly kind of post hoc analysis of data that have been acquired for, for other reasons, for clinical purposes. So these are mostly individuals who have been referred to see a neurologist because there was a, they were suspected of having some other problem. And there's a lot of variability in the way in which the data were acquired, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, sleeping overnight, sometimes during the day, under different conditions. And, and only now are there some studies underway to try and look at this systematically. Um, but the thought is um, that, you know, if, if it holds up, that, it, you know, even a number like, you know, 30% would be, a, if you find anything consistent across individuals with autism, which is as big as 30%, that, that's, a, that's a pretty big, uh, that's a pretty big signal. Um, so, um, I, you know, I'm going to do this a little bit backwards. At the first study that we did in my lab that got me interested in autism, I'm going to mention later, and I'm going to start from, you know, sort of the middle and then work back and then work forward. Uh, but at some point, you know, we, we started thinking about this and started thinking about that um, uh, and developed the, 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 the a, a, you know, a, I wouldn't even call it a hypothesis, just sort of a loose framework uh, for thinking about autism. Um, that goes like this, um, that maybe uh, it's a general disorder of neural processing, a dysfunction of neural computation um, that's evident not just in areas of the brain that are particularly involved in social and language function, but, but maybe you can find hints of it or shadows of it throughout the brain. Um, and so uh, the, the approach we wanted to take uh, was to use vision as a beachhead. Uh, take advantage of what we know about sensory systems. We have some, you know, 
reasonably good ideas about the kinds of neural computations that are performed by neural circuits in these brain areas. We have lots of experimental protocols using a variety of different methods for characterizing those neural computations and, and measuring, you know, parameters, numbers um, that go along with those neural computations. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of those. Um, and use that um, as a way of trying to assess um, use those protocols and those theories as a way of trying to assess what might be different uh, about neural computation um, in the brains of individuals with autism. Um, and, and in particular, you know, relying on the fact that there are sensory differences that at least for some folks with autism are, are severe and debilitating. Um, uh, and again, uh, lean on these computational, uh, computational principles. So, that, so that's the that's the kind of general idea of the approach. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I think we're finding some things um, that, that are interesting. And, and, that, and, that, and we're just you know, kind of at the beginning stage, but I want to tell you about what we've got. So there, there are going to be three parts in the talk. The first part's going to be about uh, fMRI. And I want to tell you about a study uh, that uh, was done by a guy named Elon Dinstein, who was a graduate student in my lab at NYU and then did a postdoc uh, with Mar Marlene Berman. Uh, and he's now on the faculty at Ben Gurion University uh, in Israel, um, living right nearby where he actually grew up. Um, and, um, uh, and Marlene was also involved uh, in this study. In fact, so the, the, all of the um, uh, autism, uh, all, all of the individuals with autism in, in these studies were recruited through the Center for Excellence uh, in Autism Research in Pittsburgh uh, with uh, Nancy Minshew, who's there and directs that center. Uh, and all of the work was done in collaboration with Marlene Berman and people in her lab. Um, so when, when, in, when initially Elon actually got me interested in doing this, uh, I contacted Marlene and we started doing this stuff together. Okay, so um, let me just outline this particular experiment for you, okay? Um, so uh, your subject in the MRI scanner, you're holding fixation on this little white dot in the middle of the screen. Uh, and there's a sequence of letters that are presented. And occasionally, one of them is repeated. Okay, And you have to press a button uh, when one of them is repeated. That's your task. Um, uh, and while you're doing that task, uh, every once in a while, um, there's uh, some, in this particular version of the experiment, there's visual stimuli that are presented in these two patches on either side of the fixation point. Um, and uh, the study was designed in order to measure sensory evoked activity, and in particular, when I get to it, the reliability of the sensory evoked responses, and also to measure adaptation. Uh, so these dots, when they were presented, um, they moved uh, outward. This patch of dots moved to the right. That one moved to the left. And then there was a brief uh, interstimulus interval. Uh, and then there was a test in which the dots might have moved on half the trials in the same direction, on the other half the trials in the opposite direction, so that we could assess uh, the, you know, an, an adaptation effect. If, if there was one, um, that would and, and look for differences in that particular computation in the brain between individuals with autism uh, and matched controls. And then there was a variable intertrial interval, as is typical uh, in fMRI experiments. Okay, so in this is one version of the experiment. And if you were a subject in our in, in our study, um, we'd put you in the scanner. Uh, we'd have you do this visual experiment, and then there was an analogous auditory experiment. Um, in which um, there was a sequence of tones instead of, uh, instead of moving visual stimuli. Uh, and, and the sequence of tones uh, was either the same uh, uh, frequency or a different frequency. Um, and, and then there was, in the, in the, there was a somatosensory version of the experiment uh, in which there was a sequence of air puffs to your hand or to the other hand, same hand or different hand. Again, similar setup, an, an adapter, uh, a brief uh, interstimulus interval, and then a test. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip part of it because we didn't find it. We found evidence for adaptation in both the, adap the autism subjects and the control subjects. And there wasn't any difference, at least in this study, in the amount of adaptations. So I'm just going to leave that aside um, and focus on the trial to trial reliability of the evoked responses. Okay? But that's the basic experimental protocol. So you would do uh, a vision run, then a hearing run, then a touch run, and then a second vision run, a second hearing run, and a second touch run in some randomized order. Okay, and that's the whole experiment. Um, and so what we did, of course, you know, let's make sure first of all that we get uh, sensory evoked responses, and you do. Um, and so this is the top row here is 
uh, responses in visual cortex to the visual experiment. Uh, there's activity there in the lateral geniculate nucleus, activity here in, in what amounts to V1 and a bunch of other early visual cortical areas. Uh, these are flattened cortical hemispheres uh, showing you where the activity is. Uh, let's see, the orange is the autism group, the blue is the control group. You get plenty of activity uh, in both groups. Uh, this is the auditory experiment. You see activity where you'd expect, also in the thalamus and, and, and in and around primary auditory cortex. Uh, and, and this is the air puffs, okay? All right, fine. So that's just a kind of a brief look. Um, there's plenty of evoked activity um, uh, in, 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 in both groups. What we then did to do a quantitative analysis of the data um, is we went and defined uh, a region of interest individually for each individual subject and separately for each of the different uh, sensory brain areas. So this is showing one example from one subject uh, of the auditory uh, experiment. Okay, um, so uh, we identify all the voxels that responded to the auditory stimuli, just looking across all of the auditory uh, runs, um, and, uh, and that's shown in orange. Uh, and, then we def and then we defined a region of interest, you know, one of two ways. We either defined it to be of, a, of the same size in each individual or at the same statistical threshold for each individual. And the conclusions ended up being the same, and frankly, I don't remember which version of the analysis I'm showing you, okay? Um, one or the other. They, they, they all, it all ended up being the same. So you do that for each individual. And so then for each individual, you have uh, a visual cortex region of interest, an auditory cortex region of interest, and a somatosensory cortex region of interest. And we could also split the analysis by left hemisphere, right hemisphere. Didn't notice anything interesting there, so I'm not going to bother showing that to you. Um, uh, and I'm just going to kind of lump it together, okay? So once we've defined the ROIs, we go back and measure the amplitude of the evoked activity on each individual trial in each of those ROIs across trials for each of the three sensory modalities in each of the subjects. And so, you know, you might say the fMRI response looks like this as a time course. Um, and, you know, this, this is actually isn't from this experiment, it's from a different experiment. Uh, but just to illustrate uh, that this is the amplitude of the response um, on average to a particular visual experiment in, in some subject from a uh, from a study a number of years ago, okay? Uh, and we can talk about the details of how you do that, that the way that I prefer to do it and the, pri the primary analysis uh, in, in the paper is you, you, you just do a regression on the time, on the time series. Those of you who do neuroimaging know what I'm talking about, uh, but it, it, it's pretty straightforward, okay? You know when the trials occurred um, and you model that and fit a number um, uh, of the amplitude uh, to, to each individual trial. All right, so here's the basic result. Um, so having done that, I now have, uh, let's say in the, in the vision experiment, I have the evoked response amplitude in visual cortex for an individual subject, and I have that number for each of a bunch of trials across, you know, across the, each of these runs of the vision experiment. So I can take that number, bunch of, bunch of response amplitudes to each trial, and I can average it across all the trials and get a mean. And then I can average that across subjects and get a grand mean and put an error bar on that. That's this right here. So that the height of this bar is the grand mean and the error bar is the standard error of the mean uh, across subjects. Orange for the autism group, blue for the control group. Uh, here it is for the somatosensory experiment in somatosensory cortex. Here it is in the auditory uh, uh, experiment for auditory cortex. Nothing to write home about. The evoked responses are just as strong and no stronger uh, in the autism group compared to the controls. This is a different variation of the analysis. Here what I do is in an individual, I look at the standard deviation across trials. That gives me a number for that individual, okay? Then I take the mean of those standard deviations across subjects and the standard error of the mean. And that's this right here. So this is the standard deviation of the autism group within subject trial to trial variability. As a last step, I compute the mean and standard error of the mean across subjects, okay? Um, so, uh, so that's in the autism group, that's in the control group, uh, and each of these um, is a statistically significant difference. Uh, greater variability, trial to trial var variability, in the visually evoked responses, the somatosensory responses, and the auditory responses in the corresponding brain area. You can also compute the ratio of these things. You take the, uh, the, um, the, the amplitude of the response, 
uh, averaged across trials within an individual, the standard deviation across trials within an individual, you take the ratio of that, and then compute the mean and standard error across uh, individuals, and, and that gives you this. So of course, because this is, this is bigger, uh, then this is smaller, right? That the responses are less, they're more reliable with the same mean, so they're gonna be uh, weaker uh, SNR. Okay, so that seems like it might be an interesting result, but it also seems like it might be Oh God, there could be a million different kinds of confounds there, right? The one that comes to mind immediately is, well, what if the, uh, what if the autism folks were not holding still in scanner? They're kind of jiggling around, moving around in the MRI scanner. That would be a source of greater variability. Or, you know, what if there are differences in pulse or respiration that could introduce uh, greater variability in the measurements? Any number of other uh, possible things. So. There's a critical uh, set of control analyses that we did, and those are illustrated in these two panels here. Um, the top one um, is to look, we defined a bunch of ROIs, a bunch of regions of interest outside of sensory cortex, okay? Um, so we defined these, uh, you know, parceling up, the, up, up different areas of the brain, but specifically uh, regions that did, in which there was not a measurable sensory evoked response to any of the three uh, experiments. Okay, um, so again, here's the response amplitudes uh, to each of the, in, in each of the experimental conditions, and these numbers are near zero by design because we defined these regions to be in places where there's not much activity. Um, but of course, there's some source of variability that's MRI, so the measurements are noisy, right? Uh, so the standard deviations are non-zero. Uh, importantly here, there's, there's no evidence for any difference. Uh, between the standard deviations uh, in, in the uh, autism group and control. And of course, this stuff is down near zero because that stuff is down near zero. So th this is the important panel here, okay? Um, so what we're seeing then is the response amplitudes are matched, the standard deviations are different, specifically in the brain areas in which there's sensory evoked activity. Uh, the, the bottom row here is a complementary analysis, same kind of logic. We also had the subjects at the end of the um, scanning session just do a few minutes in the scanner at rest, eyes closed, doing nothing. Uh, and so we could take the data from that run um, and pretend that it was one of the sensory experiments. Okay? So I can do the analysis on those data um, using the same, exactly the same analysis, the same regression matrix that, I, that, that we applied to the vision experiment as if there were visual stimuli every once in a while during the run, even though there weren't. And because there actually weren't, on average you get, you know, zero response amplitudes here. Um, uh, but again, there are sources of variability, uh, and so you get a non-zero standard deviation, but as you see here, uh, there's no differences between the groups. And that, that's the signal noise ratio again is going to be near zero because that's near zero. Okay, so that gives us actually a lot of headway because there's not these simple confounds, head movements, pulse, respiration, a whole bunch of things you might think of we can rule out uh, using this analysis. I mean, we did all the work to you know compensate for head movements, regress it out, you know, throughout runs if the motion was larger than a certain amount. But you still have to, you know, get this kind of worry, you gotta worry about that, right? So, uh, so he, I think this helps a lot, that this gave me a lot of confidence that maybe we're looking at something. Okay, so there's another issue though, um, which is, well, okay, so what if the autism subjects were holding still, uh, but you know, maybe their attention was waxing and waning. Maybe they were just getting more bored or something or they would get a little bit more bored and then wake up and more, more so than the control subjects. And so we used the task, remember they were doing this task on those letters uh, as a way of assessing uh, whether or not they were at, you know, awake, eyes open, engaged uh, during the experiment. Um, uh, and, in, and so we could measure performance uh, accuracy uh, and uh, uh, which is shown here, uh, and reaction time, which is shown here, um, uh, it, in 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 uh, it, in the task. What? Sorry, what am I looking at here? Um, yeah. Uh, so so the, the the performance, the reaction, the accuracy, and the reaction time. I have such a weird angle on the screen; I can barely read it. Uh, accuracy and reaction time uh, of performance. Um, and sure enough, I mean, so the um, uh, so so in the original analysis with the full group of subjects, um, the reaction times were nicely matched. The the accuracies were a little bit worse. Uh, in, the aut in the autism group. Um, so what we did to try to correct for that was we grabbed a subset 
of the control subjects and a subset of the uh, autism subjects that were still matched as well as we could, um, uh, but, um, but we, we got rid of, the, we eliminated from this version of the analysis the, 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 the worst performing of the, uh, of the group of autism, okay, uh, from, from, from the autism group. And so the red line here shows the performance of the whole group. Uh, the, the, the orange bar shows the performance of the subgroup after throwing away the two uh, individuals with autism that had the worst performance. Um, and the blue bar shows the matched performance uh, of, the, uh, of the control group. And likewise, the reaction times are matched. Uh, and so even when we match performance accuracy and reaction time, this is the fMRI measurements, uh, which still shows this difference in the reliability. Sorry, these were adults, not children. I should have said that. Yeah. Was it significantly below the lowest performing in the control group? These adults you might want to eliminate uh, the lowest performing by a standard deviation in both groups. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's a great question, and I don't remember. Um, uh, but but we can we can we can look it up. Okay. We can look it up. I, th I, I my guess is that it's described in the paper, but if not, I can find out for you. OK. Um, so it's not obviously due to differences in task performance, OK, because we can match that. Um, in actually just appeared, I think, online today um, is a replication of this result. Uh, Sarah High, who was a postdoc in Marlene's lab, uh, working primarily with Elon and Marlene, and I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to be a co-author of the paper, um, uh, uh, re-ran the whole study on a new group of, 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 of subjects with autism. These are all adults, high-functioning individuals with a clear diagnosis of autism um, uh, drawn from this Pittsburgh uh, population. Um, and so here you're seeing uh, the response amplitudes. Uh, black is the original autism group. Uh, the open symbol is the new autism group. The gray is the controls. Uh, the response amplitudes are, are pretty well matched. Again, there's no statistically significant differences, same analysis. Uh, and this is the standard deviations. Uh, and in each case, there's a t statistically significant difference, uh, both between the controls and the original autism group and between the controls and the new autism group. Okay? Um, so I, at some t I've lost track now, but I think there were, there were like 14 subjects in the original study and an additional like something like that number here. So the, the numbers are getting big enough at this point that it, it actually seems like it's, it's it's believable. Um, I, and my impression, you know, from the outside uh, of the autism literature is that there's just not enough uh, replication. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, just uh, it, it's, it, it's true for everything that we do. It's important to, to replicate it, make sure that Somewhere along the line, the way that you've been thinking about the problem didn't, you know, impacts the way that you analyze the data and that you look at the data impacts the way they, uh, and this is particularly an issue in something like this, that you end up kind of squirreling your way into some data analysis that shows a, a, an effect. Uh, and then, you know, as soon as you do that, no amount of correcting for multiple comparisons is going gonna, is gonna to get you out of a potential statistical bias. You got to go out there and recruit another group of subjects uh, and do ex and just nail it down. I'm not going to change the analysis. I'm going to do exactly what I did before uh, and make sure that you can replicate it in another group. So, so I, I'm 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 proud of Sarah for doing this. Okay. Um, so in the earlier study that I, I sort of alluded to, this was part of Elon's dissertation work. Um, the goal of this study was actually quite different. Um, uh, Elon wanted to uh, go after this mirror neuron hypothesis of autism, which some of you may know about, um, uh, which we didn't find support for. Um, but uh, as a side uh, analysis of those data, so, so the, the experiment was pretty simple. Uh, we had uh, people in the MRI scanner playing rock, paper, scissors, um, uh, because you, you make repeated movements of the same type, and that way we could look at, um, at the activity evoked by both observed and executed movements across a bunch of repeats. Okay, fine. So that was the basic design of the experiment. It was fun. Everybody liked it. You get to play a game in the MRI scanner against a videotaped opponent. Um, uh, no difference between in the mean evoked responses for either move, uh, uh, observed or nor for executed movements. 
a no, no, no difference in the mean responses between the autism group and the control group. Um, but in a bunch of brain areas, in motor cortex and in, uh, and in these premotor, anterior intraparietal cortex, ventral premotor cortex, uh, there were these notable differences um, in the variability, trial to trial variability uh, of, the, uh, of the activity. Uh, and it was, fa in fact, this observation uh, that was a kind of a side analysis of the original study uh, which motivated us to, to just go after it and, and, and design the sensory experiment, the, the sensory experiments that I just told you about. Okay. Um, so, um, so, so, I, I, I'm, I, so, so this is an example, I think, of the kind of thinking that, that, that we started off with, that there's a, uh, that there's a, 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 a broad, throughout the brain, a difference in, in this case, the reliability of the evoked activity. Um, and uh, and, and I'll, at, at the end, I'll try and speculate about what I think that means um, or, or what it might mean uh, with respect to both the symptoms of autism and the underlying uh, genetic uh, uh, and, 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 and molecular cellular mechanisms. Okay, uh, but now we're on to part two, which is psychophysics. Um, and uh, my goal here is, uh, is sort of twofold. Um, so one, uh, well, more than twofold, I don't know, I guess I want to say a bunch of things. Uh, one is that, so you might think, okay, if there are differences in the reliability of the sensory evoked activity, then there, then there ought to be measurable differences in psychophysical thresholds, okay? And that's kind of intuitive, all right? Uh, and just to, just to jump to the chase, we, we don't find evidence for that. Okay. Uh, this is, again, in adults. These have to be pretty high-functioning adults because they can do these, you know, threshold psychophysics tasks that, that we have to be able to instruct them to do the task. But we don't find any differences for, um, uh, in, in thresholds. Um, and while I'm on that point, uh, uh, let, so let me just point out that, you know, so the intuition, well, if it's less reliable, there should be higher thresholds. That, that, actual, that logic doesn't actually follow. It depends on what the statistics of the noise are and what the readout is. So for example, and, and Murdad knows this well, so, so for example, um, if the uh, noise in each individual neuron is statistically independent, well then you could average together across a bunch of neurons and cancel out the noise, okay? If you knew that, and then you could use that kind of readout. If on the other hand, if the noise was very highly correlated, right, then you could subtract it out, right? You could take, let's say you're doing an, you know, an orientation discrimination task, which is going to come up in a second, um, and you want to discriminate uh, orientations near vertical, right? And so you could take the responses of the neurons that prefer horizontal, that don't respond at all to the stimulus, as an estimate of the noise on that trial and subtract it off, okay? So the, the logic about whether or not there should be differences in psychophysical thresholds depends on the statistics of the noise, and it depends on, on the nature of the readout. So, so, so okay? So, it, yes? Well, how do you measure accuracy on an individual trial, Nancy? I don't know. You, do, you, you could imagine tasks where you have a, you know, a graded thing you could measure. Okay. So if so, exactly. So so we haven't done much of that yet. Um, uh, uh, there's a there's a uh, uh, paper under review again with Sarah High as the first author, uh, with a somatosensory task that's of that form. Okay, uh, and the stuff I'm going to show you here that's all published, we hadn't done that yet. This was, you know, psych psychophysical thresholds. Um, so, that, so that's one of the points I want to make, which I already made. But you're, so you're going to see that the, the thresholds look, look reasonable. Another point has to do with a, a hypothesis about attention, possible attention deficits in autism. This is another big idea uh, that's been around for a long time. Um, uh, and it's, it's sort of hard because, uh, you know, different people mean different things by attention. Right? The attention is used in different ways and in, in various different fields of, of, of psychology and the general public and in neuroscience, whatever. So we adopted this Michael Grubb, who was a graduate student at NYU in my lab, collaborating with Marissa. And of course, again, Marlene Berman was involved in these studies. Um, so we adopted the, uh, the, um, the, the kind of vision science psychophysical definition of what we mean by visual spatial attention. Um, uh, which is something that we can, uh, that, that, that we know how to measure um, in a controlled way. 
Um, and so, I, I, so, so this was a test of that, of that specific version of that idea, not the broader notion of attention that it's like, you know, what, what kinds of things are you maybe intrinsically drawn to attend to? That's not this. This is, I cue you to attend to a particular location to do a particular task. If you follow my instructions, you'll do better at the queued location and you'll do worse at other locations, that visual spatial attention. So here's what the protocol looks like. And so there's a fixation point here. Uh, there's, I hope you can see this, there are these little uh, 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 angles here that, that mark four locations in the visual field. And it, those, those locations in the visual field are where, are where uh, little stimuli are going to present, be presented, one of which you'll have to respond to. Okay? So on some of the trials, there was a, there was a, a valid cue uh, that pointed uh, to one of the locations. And when, and when, that, lo and, and when, you, and when that kind of cue was presented, um, you knew as a subject that, the, that you were going to have to make a decision based on what appeared at that location. Okay? We, we didn't, with the subject population, want to include invalid cues uh, because we were worried about the strategy, that there might be differences in strategy between the autism group and the control group. But you need to have a comparison. You can't, so to do an attention experiment, you need to have uh, always the, the stimuli have to always be the same. And you need to have two different kinds of cues of some kind or another. So, so this is a version with what we call endogenous cues. It's a symbolic cue telling you to attend to that location. In a separate set of experiments in a separate paper, Michael also used what we call exogenous cues, which are little flashes uh, that were near the location of where the stimulus was, was presented. Okay? So this is a valid cue. That's a neutral cue. It points equally to all four locations, which means that you know, there's going to be stimuli presented at all four locations. Uh, uh, and you don't know now which, you don't know yet which is going to be the relevant one. So you have to tend to all four. Okay? And there was a little inner stimulus interval. Um, and then the stimuli were presented. Okay? Um, and uh, in one version of the experiment, again with valid or invalid cues, um, the, um, uh, the stimuli were, were presented at pretty precisely known locations because these little boxes are small. I hope you can see there's little grading patches presented here. They're all near vertical, slightly tilted clockwise or counterclockwise or vertical. Um, in a different version of the experiment, the boxes were big and the stimuli could be placed always at the same eccentricity, the same distance from fixation, but at any number, number, number of positions within those boxes. So you had to spread your attention window over a larger region, which is another specific idea about attention that's been proposed, which is that, you know, which, which a specific version of the hypothesis is, well, individ individuals with autism can attend, but they're bad at changing the size of the region that they're attended to. Okay? All right. We also did this with uh, different versions of this inner stimulus interval, challenging your ability um, to, switch, to quickly switch your attention to the cued location or giving you lots of time, 50 milliseconds versus 650 milliseconds. Okay. And then another little interval here. And then afterwards, there's a response cue. So for the valid pre queue trials, the response cue was the same thing. Uh, for the neutral cues, this now disambiguates for you which of the four is the relevant location. And then you have to base a response uh, on, on what the orientation was at the response cued location. Okay, was it clockwise or counterclockwise or vertical? So that's the protocol. And the key comparison uh, is a comparison between the different cue types, right? On every trial, there were stimuli presented at all four locations. On every trial, they were randomly slightly tilted right or left or vertical. Um, uh, and, and the key comparison is, is, is what's the impact of the cue? Um, and so this is accuracy. This is reaction time, autism group, control group, valid cue, neutral cue. Performance accuracy is better with the valid cue in both groups. Reaction time is faster um, for the valid cue in both groups. Okay? Perfectly good uh, psychophysical thresholds, really big, strong attentional cueing effects. Uh, in all versions of this experiment, um, the short ISI, the long ISI, the narrow attention region, the large attention region, the results always, uh, always look like, this is one of those, I forget which condition is, it looked the same for all of them. Within the exogenous attention experiment that I'm not showing you, Michael looked at several different tasks. He looked at a visual search task. He looked at the impact of attention on, on crowding, um, uh, as well as an orientation discrimination task, con uh, uh, you know, contrast sensitivity orientation discrimination tasks like this. With both endogenous cues and with exogenous cues, we could find no way to tease apart uh, a difference in, uh, in, 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 in the effect 
of uh, valid versus invalid, uh, or, or in, in, this, in this case, valid versus neutral. In the, in the exogenous attention uh, case, it's a little flash that's either at the location that's later going to be queued as the, as, the re, as the one to respond to, or invalid at, at, the, um, uh, at, the, at, at a different location. No difference between the autism group and the control groups uh, in performance or reaction time uh, in any of these things. Okay, indistinguishable. There was actually one condition in the exogenous uh, experiments in which the individuals with autism were a little bit faster, but you know, not, n nothing to write home about, nothing particularly interpretable. Okay, um, so we don't think that, so, so this also relates back to the fMRI experiment. Remember, we had this casket fixation, and so you might, so we did that analysis uh, to try and rule out uh, you know, uh, the, the, this idea that maybe the arousal or attentional state of the uh, autism group was waxing and waning more than the control group. Uh, and, and I think this helps, uh, we, we did that analysis to try to rule that out. I think this helps with that too. These, these subjects weren't all the same subjects, but they were drawn from the same population. Um, and, uh, and they're perfectly good uh, at following the instructions to perform a task and per performing for perfectly well uh, at, in this case, a, a yet even more rigorous task. Okay, next. Um, so, here's, so here comes demo time. Um, so uh, this is going to be a binocular rivalry thing. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and I had this idea uh, because I've been working on binocular rivalry from the perspective of doing psychophysical and fMRI measurements for a number of years and computational theory. Um, and all of the computational theories of binocular rivalry, including those from my lab, um, uh, involve uh, uh, a balance in excitation and inhibition um, uh, in, 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 in the way that you simulate uh, the effects of rivalry. Um, so for those of you who haven't experienced it before, before I tell you anything more about the data, I want you to put these glasses on, um, and then I'm going to take a picture of you. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Got that. Um, if, you, if, if you don't have glasses, um, Nancy is handing them out. Um, and so now, now I need to tell you what to do. So, if you, so here's what I want you to do. So put your glasses on um, and hold your eyes on the crosshairs in the middle, okay? Um, with this, so with these glasses, you should probably have the red lens in front of your left eye. Well, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, cl close one eye so that you're seeing with the red lens, okay? And you see a spiral grating, okay? Close the other eye so that you're seeing through the green lens and you're seeing this lower contrast uh, radial grading, okay? That works for everybody. Now open both eyes and hold your eyes fixed on that crosshair in the middle. And what you should perceive is occasionally it'll switch from the spiral thing to the radial thing, and then a little while later it'll switch back. That's binocular rivalry, um, which was something that was first observed and reported uh, by um, by Wheatstone uh, in 1838, who also actually understood and discovered stereoscopic vision. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about this is that it exhibits a particularly kind of fun and interesting temporal dynamic. Um, sometimes what happens is the suppressed percept emerges initially at one location, and then it kind of sweeps around the annulus like a traveling wave, pushing the other one out of your visibility. So how many people are getting alternations? Uh, and how many people are getting traveling waves? Okay, well, some of you. Okay, you have to fix, to get the traveling waves, you have to fixate really well and don't blink. I'm waiting for you, Nancy. I'm trying. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, well, it takes some practice. It's actually, this is, so it's correlated with IQ. <laughs> okay, does it work now? <laughs> All right, so. We can measure both of these things. Um, and so, you know, so the way to measure the alternation, the way we actually did it, was not to use an annulus like this to, just to measure the, the alternation. You use a little, a little tiny stimulus um, at fixation with, with you know, a, a horizontal grading to one eye and a vertical grading to the other eye or two diagonals. I forget exactly the way we did it. You want to use a really small stimulus so you get um, uh, kind of uniform dominance of one over the other and have it switch back and forth. And sometimes, and you probably experience this, there are sometimes when uh, there's a little period during which you'll see both at once. Uh, 
um, as it's transitioning from one to the other, and we call that a mixture period. Okay, so you can measure the amount of time that you see you see one dominant, uh, the amount of time the the amount of time that you see mixtures. You can measure the time intervals between switches. There are lots of different ways of of of, of quantifying these things. Um, for the traveling waves, we, we also have a protocol for measuring that, which turns out to be important. Um, and, um, uh, and, it, and it works like this. So um, on the top row here um, uh, is a, is a, it, it is a in, in indication of what the physical stimuli were on the, on the screen. So this green uh, spiral thing was presented to the left eye. By the way, we, did, we, we, we didn't do this with red, with, with red green glasses. In, in, the, in, in the experiments, uh, we used prism glasses and split the computer screen. Okay, because some people have problems with the red green. Um, uh, so, so it's cleaner to do it without that. Um, it's also, um, th there's another source of, if you have the red green, there's another source of competition that could be set up between chromatic channels uh, in addition to the orientation uh, differences that we wanted to look at here. Okay, so uh, present one, one of these to one eye, the other one to the other eye, and then shortly after that, so you do it actually in sequence, uh, you turn the low contrast thing on first, and then the high contrast thing right after it, and there's a phenomenon um, that, that actually Jeremy Wolf worked on here at MIT many years ago called uh, flash suppression, which is the second thing tends to dominate, and particularly in this case, it's this higher contrast, it almost always dominates, okay? So, so initially what you'd see is that green thing, Okay. Then shortly after that, and this was a trick that Sang Hun Lee, Randolph Blake, and Hugh Wilson uh, came up with and published in a beautiful nature paper a number of years ago, um, you, you flash transiently a higher contrast version of this thing right at the top there. Okay. Um, and that's enough to make that little patch of the suppressed percep emerge. And then you return it immediately back to its original low contrast value, but you've already kicked this thing going, um, and it initiates a traveling wave in which the low contrast radial thing sweeps uh, the high contrast uh, uh, spiral thing out of the way. Um, and then there's a target zone, and we simply instruct subjects to press a button when the wave reaches the target zone, okay? And, 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 and we can vary um, the distance between the trigger and the target, and in that way, those different latencies and different distances allows you to estimate speed. Okay, great, good enough. Okay, so why bother with all this? Again, I alluded to this already. We have these uh, computational models of binocular rivalry. It's an interesting phenomenon. I mean, so a lot of people find binocular interesting, uh, binocular rivalry interesting because it seems like this way of getting your foot in the door to understand visual awareness and, and consciousness um, because you know the physical stimuli are unchanging, but your percept is changing. And ah, so, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm I'm like you guys. I'm you know, more kind of a quantitative weenie than that. So, so what I find interesting about it is it's a probe of neural dynamics, okay? There's, there are these interesting, dyna there's an interesting dynamical process that's happening at a time scale of, you know, seconds um, it, that depends somehow on competition between neural activity um, uh, that, that's happening at a time scale of, you would think, tens of milliseconds or less. Um, and, and that just seems really interesting to me. Um, and uh, I mentioned Sang Hun Lee and Randolph Blake, some pre previous work with, with control subjects, with, with, with ourselves as subjects, not with autism. Uh, we did fMRI measurements on these traveling waves, uh, and we observed that as you perceive these things traveling through your visual field, we see waves of activity uh, across uh, visual cortex in each of the early retinotopic visual areas, uh, and we can put a number on it, uh, that the traveling waves move at about uh, at, at, at about um, uh, two centimeters per second, uh, or in the human brain, that corresponds uh, to about 100 milliseconds per hypercolumn, okay? Which is an interesting number, right? I mean, that's like way slow compared to action potential generation. There has to be something going on within the local uh, cortical circuit uh, that has to happen before it kicks the guy next to it, uh, next to it to go, right? So interesting time scale of dynamics. Um, so the kinds of models uh, that we have for this, you know, from, from my lab, from other labs, Hugh Wilson has worked on this, John Rinzel um, at, at, at NYU has worked on this, a number of other people. Uh, the kinds of models that we have of binocular rivalry uh, involve uh, having excitatory, these little plus signs and inhibitory interactions. And in order to get it to work right, to get alternations, and in order to get traveling waves, in order to get the you know, dynamics at this time scale, uh, you need to have the right kind of balance between the excitation and the inhibition. So this seemed to me, 
uh, to be an interesting way to go after yet another hypothesis about autism, which is that it has to do with an imbalance uh, in excitation and inhibition in the brain. Okay, so this is with Chris Saeed, who's a postdoc in my lab, and again, Marlene Berman, and so Chris was running back and forth to Pittsburgh to run subjects there. Uh, he also, th this paper is actually just a computational paper um, that makes another point about binocular rivalry, which I'll mention very briefly, um, which is actually kind of an interesting and important point. Um, so if you present this stimulus to one eye, that stimulus to the other eye, you, you get out of the model and expect to see um, uh, alternations, one subpopulation of simulated neurons responding more than the other one, and there it switches, and there it switches back, and so on. Um, if you present, you know, a plaid pattern um, to one eye, that is, the, you take these two gradients and superimpose them, well, you don't and you shouldn't get alternations. If you present a plaid pattern to both eyes, you don't and you shouldn't get alternations. The, the thing is that all of the previous models, computational models of rivalry, would it, we will give you alternations here as well as here, because it's a competition between eyes and orientations, right? And there's, there's different eyes and different orientations there. And so you actually run those models, and, and, the, and the simulation here will look just like that in situations in which people don't actually perceive rivalry. All right, so we did a particular trick here to try and sort that out as a little side point. Um, but we use this model and, uh, and you know, an example uh, of, of, of one of the other models uh, to simulate what we would expect um, if you varied uh, the balance between in inhibition and excitation, okay? Um, and, uh, what, and, and by exploring um, all of the different kinds of things that you could measure, um, what Chris found uh, is that the ones that would be particularly informative are these. It's the percentage of time that you see a mixed percept, and it's the wave speed, okay? And you can see that in the, for the wave speed, uh, as you change the amount of inhibition, that affects the wave speed, uh, and, but, but it does, does, but doesn't give you a handle on the amount of excitation. Uh, if, you, if you change uh, the, 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 the balance between excitation and inhibition this way, uh, that changes the mixed percept, okay? So we're ready to go. We thought, all right, we can nail it. All we need to do is measure uh, the mixed percept percentage and the wave speed in the autism group and the control group. That's going to land us at, a, at a, a value on this guy, it'll land us at a value on this guy. Boom, we'll have our answer. That's the excitation to inhibition ratio uh, in the controls uh, and in the autistics. Um, and so he goes to Pittsburgh, does the experiment, works really hard, runs lots of subjects, recruits all of these people. No difference. <laughs> um, so this is the mixed percept time. This is the response latency as a, as a function of position around the polar angle. Um, so the wave speeds are the slopes here. And there's a slight difference, nothing to write home about, not statistically significant, okay? If anything, it's subtle in our hands. But then, nine months later, um, Caroline Robertson publishes a paper revealing that, um, that in fact she found uh, mixed percept, a difference in mixed percept duration. No difference in the overall dominance, in the dominance duration, but a difference in the mixed percept duration. And even better, that the mixed percept duration uh, was correlated with the diagnostic uh, ADOS uh, scores. Um, so that's where things sit um, as of, uh, well, this is a, you know, uh, where are we, about a year later? Um, and, and somebody has to figure this out. Um, the, 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 the apparent ostensible discrepancy here. There were important differences between the two experiments. We used little grading patches. Caroline uses faces and houses. Is that right? What did you use? Objects. Okay. Used objects. Fine. It may be that um, the competition that's being measured in that experiment is the critical competition that's, that's being measured in Caroline's experiment is happening somewhere later in the visual pathways in a higher level visual area, and that these small excitation inhibition imbalances kind of accumulate across a cascade of processing. That's possible. And so we missed it only because we used these, uh, the, you used stimuli that, that particularly probed uh, the, the competitive and cooperative interactions between orientation selective neurons with, that are very spatially precise, V1-ish. Um, there are also other differences, though. Right? We use smaller stimuli, so you know maybe something about the stimulus size matters, um, and so we need to sort it out. Um, uh, and so I don't know if you're going to do it. I, I'm not planning to, but somebody needs to. Somebody needs to do these these experiments in the same both experiments on the same group of subjects. 
Um, and, I, and I think it's going to be important to measure blinks and eye movements uh, while doing it, just to make sure that there's no confound there, because both of those things uh, can affect rivalry. OK, so that's part two. So maybe evidence for an excitation inhibition uh, imbalance, um, uh, which again would be fabulous. Just, I think it would be a, uh, you know, I th I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really intriguing result uh, and would point to a fundamental difference in, in, in neural computation and a way that we can assess it non-invasively in human subjects using good old simple psychophysics, okay? Um, you know, it's great to go in there and do your calcium imaging and uh, in particular cell subtypes and mouse models of autism, but it's also great to use the human as a model of the human. <laughs> okay, uh, part three. So before even saying anything about this, uh, so I, I wanted to throw this in there just to give you another example. I have nothing to do with this research, okay? That I'm going to tell you about, um, you know, a, a, a couple studies that have been done by Tim Roberts uh, and, in Philadelphia and some of his colleagues um, looking at uh, human MEG uh, and mouse electrophysiology. So this is in human children with autism, um, and they use the valproic acid uh, mouse model. Um, uh, so, and, and these are auditory experiments. Um, and uh, for those of you who are familiar with this, um, you know, the focus of this series of studies uh, was, is on delayed uh, auditory evoked responses, okay? But the thing that intrigued me about it most, um, uh, and, and so these are evoked responses here, um, and they, me they were measuring the timing of those responses, you know, the, the latency of those responses. Uh, and, and, and in this particular paper, um, they also did a, um, a, a, a Fourier analysis of, in particular, this phase locking. Most of this stuff is in the supplementary materials. Uh, and that's, that's the bit of it that I found to be most interesting. So I, I want to just bring this to your attention. This is a human MEG. That's a mouse. Um, so what do I, so, so what, so yeah, I think you all know what the auditory evoked response is. You, you measure the MEG signal of a bunch of trials. You average it together across trials. Fine. Likewise, uh, you know, that they, they used a, they put an electrode um, as a course potential. The electrode placement was between the thalamus and auditory cortex, uh, and they think they're measuring a very gross signal that might roughly correspond to what you get uh, out, of the, uh, out of the MEG sensors uh, that depends on activity in, in both the thalamus and, and in auditory cortex. Um, uh, and, and, so, and so that's the evoked response auditory evoked response. Uh, but I need to explain what these pictures are, what this phase locking factor is for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Okay, so uh, here's a uh, auditory evoked potential. This is actually um, scalp EEG, courtesy of Cliff Sarin. Um, and I think you all are, know and are comfortable with the notion of a spectrogram, right? Um, so you can take a little time window out of this thing from an individual trial compute its Fourier transform, compute the amplitude of the Fourier transform, average that across a whole bunch of trials, uh, and, and you plot that here. So one time window across frequency goes up this way. Then you move over and you do the next time window. You move over and you do the next time window. So you're getting um, amplitude uh, of the frequency. Uh, you're, you're, this is frequency versus time, and the color is the amplitude okay, for each frequency and time bit. What's the phase locking factor? So in doing this, I've thrown away the phase information. So there's a complementary analysis in which you throw away the, the amplitude information, okay? And so the idea is like this. So you start off the same way. I take a little time window from one particular trial. I take the Fourier transform, okay? So then I get a, a phase and an amplitude for each frequency component for that time window, okay? I'm gonna set the amplitude to one, okay? And I'm gonna save that phase value. All right? And then I do that for each of a bunch of trials. Okay? So I'm, I'm, why am I doing this? I'm in the complex plane. This is MIT. I'm in the complex plane. There's the origin. So this is amplitude. That's phase. I get a particular phase. I set the amplitude to 1. Okay? We should all be comfortable with that. Someone in the room should write down a complex exponential now. Okay, fine. Good. All right. So then I do it for the next trial, and I get another phase value scale it onto the unit circle. Do it for another trial, get another phase value. I can take that collection of phase values and average them together in the complex plane, okay? Um, if they're, they're gonna be along the unit circle, but if they all have a similar phase, the result will be pretty close to having unit amplitude, 
But if they all have different phases and I average them together, the result is going to be a number that's close to the origin. So I take the so I take the complex plane average of those unit circled phase values, and then I take the amplitude of the result of that. That's going to be a number between 0 and 1. 0 if all the phases are random, 1 if all the phases were perfectly the same from one trial to the next. And that's this picture down here. So now the, the dark blue is 0, the bright, you know, the, the darkest red uh, is a value of 1. Okay? So this is reliability of the phase of the responses for each time bin and each frequency um, across trials. So what do you see? Here's the human MEG. Again, this is in children with autism. By the way, Tim Roberts is now doing, doing these measurements on younger and younger kids. Um, TD, that's typically developing. So those are the controls. Um, ASD, you know what that is. Um, so you get these nice phase locking um, responses. This is the phase locking factor. Um, and it's much weaker here in the autism group in both hemispheres. Okay? Uh, and I read this as a measure of reliability of the timing of the responses. Okay? Um, and, uh, and I interpret their delayed auditory evoked response, which they em well, that's what they emphasize in the paper, that on average uh, the evoked responses are a little bit delayed. Um, so I read that um, as a necessary consequence of this. If the, if the, uh, so if, if the response amplitudes, the spectrograms, are roughly the same, which they are in their data, but the phase locking is different. Well, you know, there's a minimum amount of latency to get from the ear to, the, to, to wherever this signal is being recorded from with the MAG sensor. So it can't happen much earlier. It can only happen later. Okay? So if there's going to be jitter in timing, it's necessarily going to mean that on average things are going to happen a little bit later in time. Right? So I looked, at the, I looked at these papers and I thought, okay, great, there's jitter in the timing of the responses and the, and the, and the delay on average is, is actually a consequence of that. And the, and the, under, and the interesting underlying result um, is, is the jitter in the timing, um, which is analogous to what we found in the fMRI experiment. And that the response amplitudes are the same, but there's trial-to-trial -trial variability. Here, it's turning the trial-to-trial -trial variability into, into variability in timing. Not exactly the same kind of measurement, uh, but it's intriguing uh, that, there, that there's another pointer to reliability. Um, so then they did um, these experiments with the valproic acid, uh, valproic acid mouse model. For those of you who don't know, um, uh, valproic acid is, uh, is a prescription drug used for uh, epilepsy and migraines, amongst other things. Um, but um, do not take it. Um, do not give it to someone who's pregnant. Um, it crosses the placenta and causes uh, or has a really bad outcome, um, which includes uh, autism um, in some of the cases and epilepsy uh, in some of the cases. Um, and so you can do this in a mouse. You inject a little valproic acid uh, in a pregnant female, and some number of the mouse pups um, have uh, seizures and exhibit uh, some of the, you know, if, if they're whatever, mouse-like, abnormal mouse-like behavior, whatever that is. Um, and sure enough, you do these uh, electrophysiology measurements. And now again, these are coarse potentials, right? The, the electrode is somewhere in the middle of the head in between the thalamus and the cortex. Um, but there's an analogous result here. This is uh, saline injection, a valproic acid injection, again, in the mother. And these are recordings from the offspring. Um, here's this nice uh, phase locking and much reduced um, over there. Okay. So we're actually almost out of time. Uh, let me tell you what I think all this might mean. First of all, let me tell you what I think it doesn't mean. I'm not suggesting that autism is caused by unreliable sensory responses. It might contribute, but that's not what I'm saying. What I'm, I'm not saying that, oh, the auditory and visual responses are, uh, are unreliable, and so that everything kind of falls out from that. Um, I'm not suggesting that response variability is a bad thing. Um, there's, there's considerable trial-to-trial -trial variability in neural activity um, in cortex, at least, um, uh, in, in, in everybody, okay? Um, so, you know, but not in all neural systems, right? There are some neural systems in which the neurons respond like clockwork. So, so it's something about cortex in which it's a, there's an advantage to the way the computations work um, to have variability. Um, and sources of variability. We could speculate about what those might be. I don't, you know, I don't think now's the time to do that, right? But it's a hot topic. 
uh, an area of study. We had a workshop on it uh, last spring uh, at NYU, really kind of brainstorming about, you know, what are the sources of, of trial to trial variability and why might they be there? Okay. Um, uh, and um, that they're controllable. Um, so there are some results that I'm sure some of you are aware of that, you know, under different cognitive states, the amount of variability can, can be smaller or be larger, depending on what the task is, what the cognitive state is. Uh, and so the thought is not that variability is inherently bad, um, but that too much variability, right, uh, at, at, d throughout development in a way that's not controlled properly ends up being bad. Um, uh, too little variability would also, I would, I would conjecture, likely be bad uh, for the way that the brain is supposed to develop. So the idea is this, that autism might be a consequence of too much variability uh, throughout the brain during development, that we can see this because we know how to measure it um, in sensory systems, but that the same thing we conjecture um, may be going on uh, in, a, in a whole bunch of different brain areas. Okay? Um, and that the, the outcome, the developmental outcome of this um, is it, it ought to be evident and measurable in a whole bunch of different brain systems. We've seen it in auditory, auditory visual, and somatosensory sensory systems and also in some of these motor areas. Um, but if you know you had a protocol that you could use to measure activity in other brain areas, you ought to see um, uh, greater variability there as well. Um, uh, and, 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 and so the last bullet here, that hypothesizing the difference in responsibility might be a common developmental outcome of the many candidate and molecular, uh, genetic and molecular mechanisms. The notion there is, well, so you have some busted mechanism, whatever it is, you know, um, some uh, busted GABA receptor or what have you. Um, the brain's not going to sit there and take it. Uh, it's going to try to compensate for it because that's what brains do through the course of development. You'll upregulate the expression of some other inhibitory uh, receptor um, or downregulate uh, expression of some excitatory uh, system uh, to achieve some kind of, uh, of, of homeostatic equilibrium, going after some kind of an optimization criterion. Um, but, you know, kind of so, so the simplest version of this is um, that the brain is developing to try to compensate for this busted mechanism to, like, match the mean you know, to get the EI balance right and to get the average firing rate of all of the neurons right, but it can't do it perfectly, so it has to give something up, and maybe what it gives up is variance, okay? Um, you know, that, that would be the simplest version of it. Probably it's, it's a, lot, a lot more subtle and more interesting than that, that the statistics of the noise are wrong, right? Um, that, you know, there's variability, but the, there's either too much or too little correlation between different neurons in the population, um, or there's too, too much or too little variability in certain, certain states or at certain times. And we also speculate about how this might connect uh, to symptoms of autism. Some of these are pretty easy. Um, sensory hypersensitivity and motor clumsiness, it kind of seems intuitive that if the, if the sensory responses and the motor responses are unreliable, then, you know, your sensory motor world is maybe unpredictable, right? Um, and, and that could fall out. Withdrawal might be, we, although, the, although this is a primary diagnostic symptom, according to this idea, that it might actually be a secondary um, behavioral compensation of living in an uncertain world. Um, uh, likewise, repetitive behavior, primary uh, 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 be, uh, behavioral symptom, um, uh, might be a, a compensation um, uh, for um, uh, trying to take control uh, uh, in a way that might be comforting of an otherwise uh, uh, un unreliable uh, and, and, and uncertain sensory motor world, repeating the same sensory motor um, experience. Um, Learning differences in higher functioning individuals, um, again, kind of a similar idea um, that if you have this background of kind of uncontrolled or incorrect background noise statistics of the neural activity, in order to learn anything, you know, some kind of repetition or some kind, you know, the, the more connections there are, the more closely related the items are, um, the, the, the more likely it is uh, that some uh, heavy and learning mechanism will be able to win out in the face of all of the background uh, uh, noise. Again, these are speculations, but loose ideas, I think, you know, some of them are testable. Um, we're in the process of doing some perceptual learning experiments that look very promising. 
of looking at learning differences in individuals with autism. These are the hardest ones, and of course the most important, um, the, you know, the social and, and language difficulties. Of course, these are also, in this context, the hardest things to learn, um, because you have the fewest number of opportunities for repeats, right? And that's even worse if you're, you know, withdrawing uh, from, from, from your environment. Uh, and, and I think it, it may potentially speaks directly to this, uh, this kind of unreliable activity uh, in an extreme. You could see how that could be related to, uh, uh, you know, these uh, epileptiform-like um, uh, EEG responses. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of view that, you know, this is very speculative, and I wanted to throw it out here to this group, um, you know, because I know you're thinking about all of this stuff. Um, I, it's the kind of thing that I might someday want to write down in a review paper, but I, I, you know, it's not. These aren't conclusions of any experiments we've done. They're more like, um, you know, uh, maybe motivation um, for designing experiments to go after uh, some of these questions, like the sort of learning stuff that we've been looking at, um, uh, and, and, and some of these other things. So with that. I want to again mention my collaborators, Marlene Berman at CMU, who's a fabulous colleague and without whom none of this would have been possible. Marissa was involved in the attention work. Ilan, whose name I mentioned a number of times, is actually the person who's responsible for getting me interested in this set of questions. Um, and I'm glad uh, that that happened. Uh, Michael Grubb, who recently finished his dissertation uh, at NYU working with Marissa and I, uh, partly on these autism uh, questions having to do with attention and partly on some other issues of attention. Nancy, who runs the, uh, who directs the uh, research center in Pittsburgh. Uh, Chris, uh, who I mentioned, who's now a data scientist um, at, actually, he's, that's out of date. He's now at Twitter, how things change. Uh, and Pascal Wallach at NYU, who's involved in some of the more recent work uh, that's going on in my lab uh, that I actually didn't talk about yet uh, today. Uh, and with that, thank you. Sure. Um, that was really fun. Okay, thank you. <laughs> a lot of great hypotheses there. Um, what's your uh, intuitive or speculative feeling about the variability, genetically based or maybe environmentally induced during very short, tiny, critical periods of development because of the, uh, the influence of sensory inputs or very small critical periods? Um, I, you know, my thoughts about that are really only loosely formulated, um, and, and, and I'll just say generally, I, I, think, um, I think response variability uh, and noise correlations uh, are, are maybe really important, um, and, 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 I, and I think maybe really important to think about developmentally, um, that there might be um, developmental time courses. Um, to, uh, to the way in which neural circuits exhibit variability in noise correlations, okay? Um, and that, um, you know, that, that there's a, that, 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 and that that might, that those developmental time courses um, might be different from one brain area to the next as one, as one brain area develops to build its scaffolding on the way in which changes in, in its inputs occur, okay? Um, uh, and, and that all of that might somehow be linked up with the kind of classic notion of, of critical periods. Um, uh, and, uh, and I'm very, you know, so as I was saying earlier uh, to the, the coffee group and to McGonker, you know, thinking about autism has actually gotten me interested in development in a way that I never was before. Um, so, uh, you know, for me, it's been sort of a fascinating ride of broadening my research interests. Um, and, 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 I, and I, you know, that short of a specific answer or hypothesis, but I, I, I think it's a great question, and I think there's, a, 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 there, there, there's you know, multiple research programs uh, there in that question. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, does the reliability of the normal uh, participants improve through uh, repetitive uh, training? Reliability with training. Because sensory coding, I mean, uh, if you repeat the stimulus, it should improve. So 
I haven't done that experiment. Okay. We haven't done that experiment. That's an interesting question. Uh, whether, you know, in a, in, let's say, a perceptual learning uh, protocol, if you put people in the MRI scanner or did a, you know, EEG or MEG measurement like this of reliability before and after training, do you see more reliable uh, evoked responses? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Yeah, right up. Uh, so, uh, Questions. One more technical. So, when you say variability goes up, um, is it going to be within trial variability or across trial variability that goes up? And you know, as, as, a, as a way of getting at, do you know if, for example, you do some sort of a canonical correlation between two areas, two ROIs, is it higher in, in autistic subjects? That is, is it the case that you know, basically, on one trial to another, all the activity everywhere is slightly higher or slightly lower, and therefore leading to kind of cross trial increased variability? I guess that's the first one. Okay. So the the answer to the first question is: with fMRI, we can only measure these trial to trial um, changes. We don't have the temporal resolution to look at within trial uh, variability, uh, right? Uh, you know, within a brain area, okay? Yeah, yeah, across brain areas. Um, uh, and to answer the second question, so help me out here. So I, my, my impression is the literature is a little bit split on this. Um, there's, there's some people find um, uh, weaker uh, uh, interregion correlation in autism. Some people find stronger. Help me out. Yeah, but maybe the, maybe the more direct version of Murdad's question is just response magnitude. Yeah, you look at a bunch of regions that are responding on one trial when they respond more or one trial when they respond less, are they correlated across regions? <laughs> yeah. That would be the simplest version. Our beta values across two regions, yes. it's more correlated in autistic subjects. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know the answer. So that, that's a very that's a different question from like the resting state correlations, right? <laughs> this is evoked, right. evoked correlations. Um, and we'd have to, to do to do that properly. We we, we would ha we would have to do more work. I, you know, so so you just identify several different ROIs in your yeah. But we would, but we need several different ROIs that all have evoked responses. So how are we going to define the different ROIs? Well, the right way to do that in a vision experiment would be to do the retinotopic mapping, which we haven't done on these subjects, right? Uh, but if, if if we did, then we could look at that analysis and compare. Which you know. Yeah, okay, we could look, we could look at it. That's the starting point. Yeah. And, okay. and, 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 and a slightly, uh, I guess one thing I don't quite understand about the, the idea, and it's not quite like a hypothesis, is why wouldn't you expect to see the same thing in non-evoked situations? That is, this idea of reliability seems to, should have been the case for all the other RIs you tested. Um, uh, that's a great question, and, and I don't know why. But I'm glad because without that, there, the result wouldn't have been solid or interpretable, right? If, if we saw the same thing, you know, in baseline and the other brain areas in which there were no evoked responses, and if we saw the same thing in the resting state scans, then we wouldn't be able to tease apart um, whether there's any specificity to this or if it could be a compound of head movements or other things. Um, but uh, but that, you know. That's the kind of question about these results that leads you to thinking about, you know, computations, right? So, so I mean, you you know all about the whole business with response variability and its dependence on mean responses and the noise correlations and the signal correlations, uh, and yeah, it's just not the kind of question that people are asking, um, uh, for the most part, in autism. There's very little of it. I mean, I saw a little bit today. Um, you know, in, in, rather than so without offending anybody, uh, rather than taking a mouse model of autism and, and doing some very coarse measure of mouse behavior, right? Then go measure that. Right? I mean that, that's that's the kind of that's the kind of comp, comp, that's the kind of computationally motivated question that I, that I that my guess uh, is will will lead us further um, than you know ultrasonic vocalization behavior. For example, not to pick on anybody in particular, but yeah. I'm worried that you're getting your cab. Yeah. At 6:20, I should let you go. But let's thank our speaker again.